When I get to heaven, I'm going to sing just like that. That's how I'm going to sing. Oh, praise the Lord for that. Uh, thank you for the magnificent spirit you bring to this meeting. I always tell folks one of the most important things at any time God's people get together is not just the spirit on the platform and not just the spirit of the preachers, but the spirit that the people bring. Because, oh, it touches everybody. And thank you for the great spirit, the way you sing, and to all the musicians and the singers, thank you for all of this. Now, this has really touched my heart, getting to be here. Brother Wallace's preaching always touches my heart. And Brother Kelly this morning, what a dear man. I've known him a long time, and how God's hand is on Rodney Kelly. And uh, what a magnificent message. And uh, Brother Bonner, boy, thank you. Uh, if you are not behind that man, uh, I, I, I don't want to scold you, but I would scold you. Boy, we, we need missionaries like him everywhere. Everywhere. Now, we have a command to reach this world. And please hear me, we're failing. We're not getting it done. You know, we, we love to look at other groups and talk about what they're doing wrong and what they need to fix. But we don't like to stand up and say, let me tell you what we need to fix. And boy, getting the gospel to the world. And Beams, what a magnificent ministry. What a magnificent. And listening to these two preachers this morning uh, preach on prayer. I'll never forget, I was in a court. Everything was going wrong that could go wrong. I mean, did you ever have one of those days? I mean, I'm, the, the judge has given me fits. You know you're in trouble when the jury looks at you and keeps going like this. And, <laughs> and, and literally, finally, the preacher turned to me and he said, Boy, I thought you were a much better lawyer than this. And, and I told him, you know, I thought so too. <laughs> I mean, what can I tell you? If I lived to be 200, his wife changed me that day. She walked up to me at one of the breaks, and she said, man, it is great. It's going great. And I said, well, what, what are you watching? <laughs> she said, Brother Gibbs, I'm telling you, it's okay. I got ESP, and we're okay. I said, you got ESP? She said, I sure do. And I'm telling you, it's okay. I said, you got extrasensory perception? She said, no, 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 I got ESP. Enough sense to pray. That dear lady changed my life. Wow. I was having the privilege to preach for Dr. Pope, Johnny Pope, who, once again, I want to just extend his heartfelt grief at not being able to be here. Now, he needs to be by his mother's side right now. And uh, keep her in your prayers, please. But I was preaching for him, and he said, Brother Gibbs, on, on Monday morning, he said, now, no, no, nobody have come in to preach wants to do this, but he said, we have a big prayer meeting at our church every morning at 5 a.m. And the men come to pray at 5 a.m. And he said, we call it alive at 5. And I'll tell you what went through my mind. Yeah, alive at 5, dead at 6. I mean... <laughs> That's awfully early to get up. And he said, would you like to come pray? <laughs> yeah, and I said, yeah. I'll... You know, and I thought, I'm going to get up at 4 a.m. He's going to pick me up at 4.30. We're going to get there, and there are going to be three, four, five faithful men there. Unbelievable crowd. And 
And I said to him, how, how do you get this? Oh, well, he said, you got to believe prayer is important or your people will never believe it's important. And they got to see you pray. If somebody prayed like you pray, where would we be? Where would we be? Turn in your Bibles, please. Boy, my heart's been challenged. Maybe you're sitting here and you say, my prayer life is just on a 10 scale of 12. Well, I'm going to tell you what. We get to heaven and see what could have been if we'd have prayed. I have a feeling we're going to be powerfully upset with ourselves. Prayer moves the hand of God. And prayer is not a suggestion. It is a command. Now, I'll not ask you to do it here, but I have asked people, have you ever prayed one hour for this nation? Now, you've watched Fox News for an hour. And you've griped about it for an hour. But have you ever said, America matters enough to me that I'll pray an hour for this land? Boy, we've got to be the people who are the people of prayer. Second Timothy chapter 3. Thank you, Brother Fred, again for the great honor. My heart's been touched by these messages this morning. And boy, all of the great preaching and the spirit these precious men bring to this platform. And thank you again, my brother, for your ministry and song. When you read... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Word of God, and you know this passage, it's often memorized, gives a list of sins that God says are going to inundate us in the last days. And these sins are going to come in like a tidal wave, like a flood. And I love to preach from this passage because... In all the times I've heard it preached on, we almost preach about this passage as if it were purely prophetic. This is going to happen. But God doesn't end it with a prophecy note. He ends it with a command. And what he says is, here's the sins. Make sure you get away from them. From such turn away. Doesn't matter where I go, north, south, east, west, sweep the heartland. The simple fact of the matter is, most of God's people have gotten comfortable with these sins. And instead of being repulsed by them, instead of getting away from them, we're against them, kinda. We're against them, somewhat. And we're living the spiritual devastation of what it causes. Let's get ready to read. Mark your scriptures. Chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now circle the word perilous in your Bible, would you? Uh, it's not the word we most commonly use today. We think of something perilous as being dangerous. The word perilous here was for something so dangerous, it was beyond description. It was something so awesomely frightening. Uh, this word is used one other time. Turn in your Bibles back to the book of Matthew. Turn to Matthew, please, chapter 8. And look at verse 8, chapter 8, verse 28. Speaking of Jesus, the Bible says, And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesens, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, and then the Bible says, exceeding fierce. That's the identical word. Exceeding fierce so that no man might pass that way. God says these sins are going to be devastatingly destructive. 
do we fear these sins? Are we careful? Our ministry for many years had a wonderful airplane, a small airplane that we used, and boy, we flew thousands of hours. It enabled us to keep schedule and things that were incredibly helpful. And then it just got beyond our financial wherewithal to keep it, and so we sold it. And I sold it to a good friend. That airplane had a placard on it. The airplane had what's called a laminar flow wing. Now, most people don't understand. Airplanes do not fly from what happens on the bottom of their wing. They fly from what happens on the top of their wing. When you fly in an airplane, you create a vacuum on the top of the wing, and it lifts itself. Well, with a laminar flow wing, it's very smooth on top, and the plane can get a lot of speed, but it's dangerous because if you don't watch the wind going over that wing, the airplane will stall. Now, all planes will stall. If you don't keep enough airspeed, it falls out of the sky. But most planes give a pretty good warning. With a laminar flow wing, you don't get hardly any warning. You're just going along and whoosh, and you only think you've been on a roller coaster. Boy, when that wing falls out from underneath you, I mean, you go down just, whoa. Well, I told my friend that bought the plane from his dear, dear Christian brother, I said, man, now be careful with this wing, Bobby. I said, this is a great wing, but th th this wing, there's a placard right there. It's in the manuals. Every time you go take recurrent training, they warn you, man, watch your airspeeds. Don't get this thing tight on airspeed, because when this falls, you don't get a warning. Oh, I will, Dave, I will. Every time I saw him, I said, how's the plane doing? Oh, he said, great, great, great. I said, you're being careful about that airspeed, right? Oh, I am, I am. Then I got a call. It was from his wife. Brother Gibbs, Bobby just killed himself in the plane. Would you come help do the funeral? I said, oh, no. No. What happened? Man, I talked to the guys who flew with him. They said he got comfortable slowing that plane down. And this one time, it bit him and took his life. Bobby, it's right there on a plaque in front of you. Man, all of my warnings, all of the training warnings. And it didn't stop him from destroying himself and taking some other people with him. God says these sins are exceedingly dangerous, perilous, highly probable that some wonderful people in this auditorium this morning are going to be destroyed by these sins. Let's get ready to read the list that God gives us that we're supposed to be so unbelievably cautious about. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now God's going to list 18. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, Blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Well, I don't care where you go, kids defy their parents. Did you ever see a mom used to up that and the kid doesn't stop anything? One more time, you're going to get it. After the mom has said one more time, 30 times. Uh, and when you're in airports, I often feel like volunteering my services <laughs> and saying to these people, that kid doesn't hear well. Man, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers. Boy, circle that one. Do you know what I've discovered? Christians break their word. They make a commitment 
and don't keep it. Man, I was raised a man's only as good as his word. But now all of a sudden, we've gotten comfortable. We, I know they said they'd do that, but you know, Brother Ferret, they don't be surprised if they... That's truce-breaking. You gave your word. False accusers. Incontinent. Underline that one. That's a huge sin. Incontinent means they can't control themselves. They're out of control. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Heady. High-minded. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now say in unison the next four words. From such turn away. This morning I ask you a very simple question. How good are you at getting away from these sins? At putting distance, keeping them out of your life, out of your ministry, out of your family. The command is be sure to get away from this. For the next few minutes, I've picked three of these sins. Now the three I've picked are no more important or less important than any of the others on the list. But the three I've picked are a challenge in my life. And I've picked them because I think they might be a challenge in your life. They're all found in that first verse. The Bible says, verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. Brother Gibbs, I love the Lord. Yeah, but not like you love you. Do you know why praying all night is such a terrible thing to even consider? Because you love you. Now, if I offered you $5 million to pray tonight, you'd be amazed how you'd feel led to pray the night through. In fact, most of you would say, could we do a couple more? Because you're being offered something that you love. The command of scriptures were to love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our might, all our strength. And you see, here's the problem. When you start loving yourself, it always comes at the expense of loving Jesus. And he said, men are going to be lovers of themselves. Boy, do I have a challenge with that. I love the Lord. I do. I love working for the Lord. I love the privilege of serving the Lord. But man, then pops up me. And all of a sudden, I love me. I just finished a case in Boston. I'm going to fly that night from Boston to Los Angeles. And I'm tired. It's been a horrific two weeks. And I'm going to get on this airplane and I call. And if you fly quite a little bit, some of you know this, you can occasionally get complimentary upgrades. So I said, any chance of an upgrade? He said, no, 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 747, totally full, no upgrades. I said, well, can I get an aisle seat? And they said, yeah, we can get you an aisle seat. So I get an aisle seat. I get to the Boston airport, get to Logan airport, get on the plane. I'm sitting in my seat. And big airplane. There's three seats here, five in the middle, three over there. Well, I'm here on the aisle. Next to me are two seats. Now they're loading the airplane and I'm praying, Lord, send somebody thin to sit next to me. Now, want you to hear me. When you love you, you will be the focus of your prayer life. When's the last time you prayed for somebody else's ministry more fervent than yours? When's the last time you prayed for somebody else's family more fervent than yours? Oh, when you love you, you will become the focus of your prayer time. I love what Spurgeon told his preacher boys. He said, don't ever, ever, 
ever have a prayer list that doesn't have ten things on it for others before it has one thing on it for you. Because he said, otherwise you'll end up loving you. Wow. While I'm sitting there praying. Now, the seats on these airplanes are small. If you fly at all, you know they're not big. And the problem is they're getting smaller and I'm getting bigger. And I've, I've often, often told people, man, once I sit in an airplane seat, I really do not need a seat belt. I don't. Once, don't you laugh at me, some of you don't need one either. Once I'm wedged in, man, turn this baby upside down. I'm not going anywhere. I am the chunk right there. And I'm going to tell you what's as bad when they lean back. Man, when the guy in front of you leans back, you could shave him or do dental work on him. I mean, his head is in your lap. So I'm praying away, man. Lord, send some. And here comes a, a real thin lady. I, oh, that'd be a good one. Yeah, Lord, that'd be. And I pass right on my. Man, here comes a heavy set. Oh, no, Lord, no, come on. Lighten up a little bit, Lord. No, 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 no. And I'm just praying away for those seats because I'm going to sit next to him for seven hours. Here comes a lady with a baby, and the baby is sick. And then she comes, stops, she says, I'm in the middle in there. I said, oh, okay. And then she's real nice. She's apologized. Oh, she said, I am so sorry to be sitting by. She said, my baby's sick, and, and, and we're, we're just having a time. Now, I love babies, if they're my babies. But seven hours with somebody else's sick baby? When you love you, all of that will bug you. Do you know why that stuff bothers you? Why it bothers me? Because we love ourselves. She gets in and, boy, this little baby is sick. And she said, uh, I, I'm sorry. I don't know. I'll be all right. And, and I'm, I'm talking to myself. I'm saying, now, be nice. Be Christian. How many of you all have ever talked to yourself like that? I'm just squawking at me. And she said, I, I, I got some medicine here for him. And I, I think maybe this will help make him sleep. And I'm like, man, give me the bottle. Let's give him the whole thing, man. We'll just put this baby in la-la land and get this over with. And nice lady. But I'm like, boy, this is going to be a time. Now more people are coming, and a guy comes down the aisle and stops at our row and hands her something. And he said, here, you might need this. And then he goes walking on. And I thought, I wonder if that's her husband. And I'm telling you, the Lord started speaking to my heart and said, well, if that's her husband, you ought to give him your seat. Because that's what you'd want somebody to do for you. But I turned around and watched where he went. He's more towards the back. Remember, there's three, five, and three. He's in the middle of the five. You are better off getting in a suitcase and going as luggage. And I'm looking at him back there. I want to tell you what's going through my mind. Lord, we don't know that's her husband. He never said he was. Now, why don't you hear me? You, when you love, when this sin gets a hold of you, you will wiggle everything your way. And it'll make sense to you. Because you love you. The Lord's just not giving me any rest. I mean, I'm like, so finally, I, I, I said to her, I said, 
you know, could I ask you a question? She said, sure. I said, that guy who handed you something, was that your husband, maybe? Wasn't, was it? <laughs> oh, you'll get artful at how you handle the questions. And she said, yeah, that, that's my husband. That's my husband. I said, oh, how about that? <laughs> now, I'm sitting there, and the Lord said, it's her husband. I said, yeah, but maybe this isn't his baby. So finally I turned to her and I said, you know, can I ask you a question? I said, is, that's your husband, is this his baby? <laughs> and I realized it came out wrong. Her eyes were, you know, like this. And she said, well, yeah, that's his baby. <laughs> I said, oh, how about that? I have watched pastors manipulate everything to their benefit and comfort. I have watched God's people manipulate everything to their benefit and comfort. I have done it because we love ourselves. I'm just sitting there miserable and I'm like, boy, Lord, I don't want to go back and sit in that crazy seat back. But finally I turned to her and I said, I don't know if this would make any sense. I said, I'm a Christian and I'm born again. And the Bible says I'm supposed to do for you what I'd want you to do for me. And it's just not coming out well at all. <laughs> and she's kind of looking at me like, what now? I said, let, let me make this clear. I said, if you were my daughter and this were my grandbaby and that was my son-in-law, I'd want him to... I, I said, I, I want to go back there and get your husband's... swap seats with your husband. And she looked at me and she said, No, you don't want to do that. She said, Look back there. Then I turned around and looked. He is not only in the middle. Now, while this has been going on, two exceptionally large women have filled in on each side. She said, you, you, you don't want to do that. You, you, you won't even fit. And I said, well, dear Lord, that takes care of that. And I offered, right? I offered. God doesn't ask you to offer. He commands you to prefer others. He commands you to do for them what you'd want them to do for you. And you know what messes all of that up? Loving yourself. So I'm sitting there saying, man, man I offered, and she said no, and that's that. But the Lord said, I don't want you to do it because she wants it. I want you to do it because I want it. Finally, I said to her, this won't make any sense to you, but I need to go back and offer to swap seats. And I said, I'll give you a gospel track here. And please, would you read it? And Man, I gathered all my stuff up, got my stuff out of the bin, and went trucking back. Now I come by her husband. He's watching all this, and I said, could you come out here? And, I mean, he works his way out to the aisle. And uh, I said, I'm sitting up there by your wife and your baby, and I'm a born-again Christian, and I'm supposed to do for you what I'd want somebody to do for me. And by command of my God, I'm to prefer your comfort over my comfort and I'm to prefer your seat over my seat. And he's looking at me like, what now? 
And I said, I, I want to swap seats with you. He said, oh, you, you don't, you don't want to do that. <laughs> now, a very substantial sized black lady who's sitting on the one side of him, when she hears swap the seat, she joins in. No, 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 no. <laughs> And she is talking so loud, she said, no, 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 no. Mister, you know, he's a little thin stick of a guy. You're a big fat guy. And, and I mean, and everybody's turning around. To... And I'm like, oh, man, I have run into the mouth of the South. How in the world? I said, you know, mister, this don't have to make sense to you, but it makes a world of sense to me. You see, I was sitting up there having a war with me. When you love yourself, yeah. making sure other people get a better seat than your seat. Oh, no, 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 no because we love ourselves. I said, if you'd read this tract, and I gave him one, I said, enjoy the flight with your family. He looked at me and he said, well, can I do something? I said, no, no. He said, well, let me buy you some alcohol. <laughs> what did he say? And I said, no, 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 I don't drink, I don't drink. And out of nowhere, I said, no, I don't drink. I'm a Christian. He said, well, would you like to go to the Olympics? Now, this is when the Olympics were in Salt Lake City. Here's what he didn't know. We had been working for months to make it possible for soul winners to witness and win souls all over the Olympics. Wherever the Olympics are, we go do that. That's part of our ministry. And when we went to Salt Lake City, the authorities there, we said, we want to hand out gospel tract. They said, oh, no, 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 no. And we said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, man, we went at it. Finally, they said, okay, okay, you got the right to do it. But they said, you cannot go into the village. That's where all the athletes are without a village ticket. And that's $1,500 a day. And you cannot go in the events especially the popular ones, without a ticket. And some of those are multiple hundreds just for one event. We said, no problem. He said to me, would you like to go to the Olympics? I said, what do you mean? He said, the granddad to that baby up there, my father-in-law, he said, owns the largest printing company in California. And he said, maybe the United States. And he said, we have just bought millions of dollars in Olympic tickets. And I'm in charge of handing them out. I said, have, have, have you got village tickets? He said, how many do you want? I said, those are 1,500 a day. He said, mister, I got 1,000 of them. How many do you want? I said, can you get me in the finals? And then I said, oh, he said, I got them all. He said, they're yours. We had soul winners everywhere. You want to see God break out? Stop loving yourself. It's a devastating sin. And by the way, it's of sin you got to battle every day. Because it will keep popping up. And God says it's exceeding fierce. It will destroy us. When we landed in Los Angeles, I spent most of that flight standing. Because literally, I mean, those dear ladies in me were like crunched. But when we got there, the father-in-law came up to me, down by baggage. 
And he said, I don't understand your faith. He said, why would you give up your comfort for them? You see, when you prefer others, you will give up your comfort for others. Now, I wish I could tell you, oh, man, I just sat there in the minute I saw it. Oh, yeah, I got to do that. It didn't happen that way. Because I did not want to let go. God's looking for us to not love ourselves. Look at the second sin. Number one, they'd be lovers of their own selves. The second sin I've picked, they'll be proud. They'll be proud. Wow. You can't do a sin any more devastating to your family, to your life, to your ministry than to be proud. You know what God says in James? He resisteth the proud. Do you understand if we got pride in our life, we got God against us? People come to me all the time and say, oh, Brother Gibbs, we're, we're having this terrible, terrible men. We're fighting this big battle and... Man, the devil's just given us fits. And I always say to them, are you sure it's the devil? And they say, well, what do you mean? I said, you don't have any pride in your life, do you? Because if you got pride, my Bible has a promise that God will resist the proud. No one in their right mind wants to leave here with God resisting the proud. Now, there's only one way to defeat pride, and that's to humble yourself. In the measure you humble yourself, pride dies. But in the measure you don't humble yourself, pride soars exponentially. Thinking we're something thinking we ought to be appreciated, thinking we ought to be recognized, thinking that's all pride talk. It's all pride. When my son Jonathan was about five years old, uh, we lived on a small farm and we had cats that lived in the barn. And we fed them every day. And the dogs loved to get the cans of cat food out of the trash and lick them out. And you had to be careful because if you didn't keep the lid on the trash tight, they'd get them and they'd take them out into the lawn and then we had these big lawnmowers and one went over it and cut up a couple of cans of this cat food. Well, Jonathan is outside playing with some of his friends. It's in the dark. They're running. He falls and you couldn't do this if you tried. He fell and his hand came down on one of those cut lids and he cut his hand all the way through. It was hanging by a thread. Cut all of the fingers loose. I mean, you couldn't have taken a knife and executed this slice. Everybody comes running in, blood's flying everywhere we immediately run to the local hospital. We get there and they looked at it and they said, oh, that hand's gone. And we're in no position. I immediately called the doctor friend of mine who I knew, man, he got up out of his sleep, came up, he said, oh, David, he said, I gotta get you to a surgeon specialist right away, right away. And, and he said, he's a friend of mine. And man, we, we drove almost two hours, got there. Now it's, two o'clock in the morning and Jonathan's in agony and this specialist came in and I said how do I thank you he said Mr. Gibbs I'm a doctor this is why I'm a doctor and he looked at me and he said I'm not a doctor for the sake of pride. I'm a doctor for the sake of serving. Yeah. Wow. 
he operated on my son's hand for the next eight hours. Attached all the ligaments, all the nerves. Eight hours after he'd been up all day in surgery already. Pulled out of bed, but he said, I'm not a doctor so people can call me doctor. We better be careful that this doctor stuff isn't pride. He said, I'm a doctor so I can serve. Jonathan's hand to this day has a wicked, perfect scar. And everybody who sees it says, who did that? That's amazing, that surgery. Well, I'll tell you what, a real doctor did that. A man who wasn't proud. Christmas Eve, my newest grandbaby was born under very bad conditions. And when the baby was born this past Christmas Eve, at about six o'clock, the baby flatlined. And the nurses came running out and said, the baby's dead. The doctor there had tried everything. Two doctors who were on their way to Christmas parties had stopped at the hospital to pick something up. The two specialists, one's walking the hall this way, one's walk. they don't even know each other's there. And they're walking down that hall to go to their offices to get something. And they hear this nurse screaming, the baby's dead, and they come running. Those doctors went in there and didn't leave for a whole night. When I said to them, how do I thank you? You saved my grandbaby. They said, it's why we're doctors. We're not doctors to go to Christmas parties. We're not doctors so somebody can look up at us. We're doctors. You're a servant of the Most High King. And if we're not careful, pride gets a grip. You're here to be used. Oh, Brother Gibbs, these people just want to use me. That's why you're there. But they don't appreciate me. God never said they would. That doctor that worked all night on my grandbaby, I said, thank you. He said, you have to thank me. That's why I'm here. And then he said, do you understand what a privilege it was for me to get to save that baby's life? What a privilege it is for you to be used If you don't want to be used, I beg you get out of the ministry. Because the people will figure out being used bugs you. And then pretty soon they won't want to be used. Pride. Pride. When I go places, people say, oh, thank you for helping, thank you for coming. And I always tell them, you got it all backwards. I owe you for the privilege of letting me serve. Thank you. The sin of loving ourselves. The sin of pride. Write the third one down and I'm done. By the way, I've picked these three because I believe they're spiritually all joined at the hip to each other. They'd be lovers of their own selves, they'd be proud, and they'd be unthankful. Unthankful. Wow. Do you know that thanks is a command of God? There isn't any such thing as a good Christian who isn't effusively thankful. You are only as good a Christian as you are thankful. 
because the command of Scripture is, in everything give thanks. And then God says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, here's my problem. I'm thankful for what I'm thankful for. But there's just a whole heap of life that's not my druthers. And you know what God says? I want you to give thanks in everything. My wife has helped me with this. When's the last time you made a list of what you don't like and gave thanks for it? Yeah, but Brother Gibbs, I'm not thankful for that stuff. Get thankful. That's the command. If we're not careful, we act spoiled. We act like kids. Well, God, I don't really like this, but I'd really like that. You know what God says? I want you to start thanking me for everything. In everything, give thanks. Wow. The scripture says, in everything by prayer and supplication, in everything, let your request be made known unto God. With thanksgiving. How good your thanksgiving. Buster Roloff, how many of you remember that dear man? Wonderful. I had the privilege of defending him 14 different trials. And he, he had a horrible habit, horrible. He would call unbelievably early in the morning. 3.30, 4 o'clock, he'd call, get you up. And then he'd say, I didn't wake you up, did I? And you'd sit there and you'd say, no, I was just sitting there waiting for you to call. No, I... Well, we're in trial one morning, he calls me, he says, come on down to my motel room. Come on down, come on down. So man, I went down to his motel room. He had a room with two beds. When I walked in the room, he has papers all over the one bed, all over the second bed. I mean covered. All on the floor in between, all around the floor coming this way, all over the dresser, all over the desk, all over a little table. I said, are these papers for the trial? He said, no, these are my prayer list. I said, this is your prayer list? I want you to hear me. I've never met anybody with a great prayer life who didn't have a great prayer list. Because when we pray without a great prayer list, we're kind of like done in 10 minutes. What's the list that you got for what you want God to do for your wife? Oh, I promise there's 60, 70 things. What do you want God to do for your kids? What do you want God to do for America? What do you want God to do for your ministry? But you'll never think of them if you don't have a list. I'm looking at this list. And he said, let me show you where you are. Now I'm three, four places. He's showing me my name on the list. And he said, over here is a special list. I said, what's this? He said, these are all the people trying to destroy me. And I'm praying for them. Because I want to give thanks for each one. I said, give thanks for him. I said, don't you want God to like, gazap him? He said, I'm commanded to love him and do good to them and bless them. Is that you? How's your thanks giving? I'm at a church, and it's we're doing a case there, and it's Thursday night visitation, and we went to go to the visitation. And they bring a young lady in in a wheelchair. And she's a thalidomide baby. A devastating drug. How many of you remember the thalidomide when it came out? It caused horrific birth defects. 
she was born with no arms, no legs. Just her trunk. And she's strapped in this wheelchair. And when she came in, the preacher said she never misses coming to any service, but she never misses visitation. I said, wow. And the preacher is given a little challenge before we're going to go out. And he said, anybody with a prayer request? And anybody want to give thanks for something? And she goes like this with her head. She has no arms to raise. And the preacher said, Diane, what is it? What is it? She said, I, I just want to give God thanks for my nose. I got such a good nose. And it really works good. And I just want to give God thanks for my nose. And I'm like, give God thanks for your nose. The preacher sitting next to me said, Brother Gibbs, let me explain. When we go out on visitation, we take her to a Walmart or a grocery store, and she sets up outside, and as people come out, she says, would you come over and talk to me? And they all come. And her Bible is in a little packet on the back of her wheelchair. And she says, would you get my Bible out? And they all do. And then she says, would you open it and face it to me and bring it up here by my face? And she uses her nose to turn the pages. I'm so thankful God gave me a great nose. I felt that high. I thought, God, you have given me so many things that I just take for granted. It starts with loving yourself. And then you get proud. Boy, I ought to be. That's all pride talk. The best man here is a sinner saved by grace. The best lady here is a sinner saved by grace. The only third worth getting proud of is the Savior we serve, not ourselves. And then they'll be unthankful. These sins have come in. And what we've done is we've said, well, yeah, I'm not as thankful as I should be, but I'm more thankful than, and we all want to find somebody we can compare ourselves to. That's pride. Because you're looking for a way to make you look good. The Bible says, make sure you compare yourself to the perfect standard. Pride, loving self, unthankful. Father, thank you. Your word is so clear about how devastating these sins are, perilous, exceeding fierce. God, by your grace, we want to be the people who show this world what we're supposed to be, what we're called to be. Heads are bowed. How many of you say, David, God sure spoke to my heart in the last minute. Hold your hand up if that's true. I'm going to ask the piano to start to play. If God spoke to your heart, you raised your hand. Would you step out and come to this altar? This service is going to be over in mere moments. Lovers of their own selves. Proud. Unthankful. Unthankful.